Nächste Runde. Ancient Beliefs. Das habe ich durch. Das heißt, das nächste Divination. In this section, divination and various divinatory forms are examined. The similarities and differences of the different forms will be described. Okay. Aromancy, a form of divination of foretelling future events by observing atmospheric phenomena such as when the death of a great man is foretold by the appearance of a comet. Francois Latour Blanche stated that aromancy is the art of fortune telling by specters which are made to appear in the air or the representation by the aid of demons which are projected on the clouds as if by a magic lantern. As for the thunder and lightning, he added, these are concerned with the auguries and the aspect of the sky, and for the planets belong and of the planets belong to the science of astrology. Within Christianity, an act of aromancy might be thought of as the phenomena of the star of Bethlehem when Christ was born. Okay. Auguries. Augury is an ancient form of divination. The term augury properly refers to the practice of the Greeks and Romans to foretell future events by the observation and interpretation of the flights, chattering or singing of birds. This method of divination was practically unknown in ancient Mesopotamia and Palestine. Electromancy or Electriomancy An ancient divinat divinatory for that utilized a cock. When practicing this divination, a circle which was divided into as many parts as there were in the alphabet was drawn in a closed place. Then a wheat corn was placed in each section beginning with the first letter, or A. Whoever placed the corn must recite a certain incantation while doing it. The time for this divination is when the sun or moon is in Aries or Leo. Okay. Moment. Arius Leo. The cock must be young and white. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> um, when his claws are cut off. He is forced to swallow both of them together with a small roll of parchment made of lambskin, upon which have been previously written words. Now the diviner holding the cock must repeat a certain incantation or conjuration. Next, when putting the cock with the circle, he must recite two verses of the psalm, which are exactly the mid most of the 72 verses in the entry on onimancy and it should be noted on the authority of an ancient rabbi that there is not anything within these 72 verses which is not of some use within kabbalism the cock being in the circle is observed to see from which of the letters he pack the grains and upon these others uh, and upon these others must be quickly placed because frequently some words often contain the same letter two or three times the letters should be written down and assembled for they will infallibly reveal the name of the person concerning whom the inquiry was made 
A story of doubt concerns the magician Iamblichus, who used this divination to discover the successor of Valens Caesar in the Roman Empire. However, the bird just packed four grains that spelled T H E O, Theo. This left a great uncertainty. The letters could stand for Theodosius, Theodotus, Theodorus, Theodectus. When Valens heard of this divination, he had several persons murdered whose names began with these letters. The magician, to escape his known fate, drank a draught of poison. This form of divination resembles the use of planchette or Ouija board. Another form of electromancy is something practiced when a cock crows or is heard crowing. Another version of the above divinatory incident was related by Amanius Marcellinus in the 4th cen century AD. In this version, the ritual is described somewhat differently. Sorcerers begun by placing a basin made of different metals on the ground and drawing around it at equal distances the letters of the alphabet. Then the sorcerer possessing the deepest occult knowledge would come forth, enveloped in a long veil, holding in his hands branches of vervain and letting forth dreadful cries which were accompanied by hideous convulsions. Eventually, almost immediately, he would stop before the basin, where he became rigid and motionless. He then struck with a branch in his hand upon a letter several times, and then proceeded doing likewise on other letters until the sufficient amount was selected to form a heroic verse, which was then given out to the assembly. When the Emperor of Valens was informed of this divinatory ritual, he was so appalled that the infernal powers had been consulted concerning his destiny, that he ordered that not only the sorcerers, but all the philosophers in Rome be severely punished, that many lost their lives. Details of the performance of electro electriomancy are exactly and curiously described in the fourth song of the Kakwe Bombek, written by the 14th century poet Ronquier. Kabbalah. The Kabbalah, also Kabbalah, Kabbalah, or Kabbalah. <laughs> Sorry. It's a system of thought which was originally included in Jewish theos theosophy, philosophy, science, magic, and mysticism. Kabbalah is Hebrew for that which is received and refers to a secret oral tradition of teaching which extends from teacher to pupil. Kabbalah, which is the spelling usually preferred by scholars, specifically refers to oral mystical teaching not normally revealed to the general population, but passed on from the adepts to the initiates. The term Kabbalah itself was first applied to secret mystical teachings in the 11th century by Iba Gabriel, a Spanish philosopher and has since become applied to all Jewish mystical practice. Although the Kabbalah is founded on the Torah, the Jewish scripture and other sacred writings, it is no intellectual discipline and the mystic is not to practice it in sol solitude, but is to employ it to enlighten humanity. The Kabbalist seeks two things, an union with God while maintaining a social, family and communal life within the framework of traditional Judaism. 
Those who have adopted the Kabbalistic teachings have modified these latter aims. In legend, God taught the Kabbalah to some angels, who in turn, after the fall, taught it to Adam. The Kabbalah was to help humankind to return to God. It then passed to Noah, to Abraham and Moses. Moses included the first four books of the Pentateuch, leaving out Doi Du. Teronomy in the Kabbalah before he initiated 70 elders into it. The elders initiated others into it. It is thought that David and Solomon were Kabbalistic adepts. Eventually the oral tradition ended and the knowledge was written down. Many of the basic ideas and principles found in the Kabbalah are also found in Gnosticism because both were in the Eastern Mediterranean near the time of Christ. Both attach an importance to knowledge called the Gnosis or the knowledge of God. This knowledge does not come from rational thinking but is inspired by God. As in Gnosticism, sin is not considered to be wrongdoing but ignorance which separates humankind from God. The knowledge specifically the Gnosis, unites humankind to God. To know God is to be God. Those sharing this Gnosis are the elect. They are the enlightened ones who share the knowledge of God, although they may not lead perfect lives. The Kabbalists share similar goals as did the Gnostics. Each group set out to answer the religious paradoxical questions of life, such as why does the world possess both good and evil characteristics when it was created by a god who is all good? Why is the world finite, uh, finite, finite when it was created by an infinite, uh, finite, uh, why is the world finite when it was created by an infinite god? Similar questions which are asked concerning the world can also be asked of humankind. Of all of the questions concerning God's relationship with the world and humankind, there seems to be one ultimate question. God, by his very nature of being infinite, all good and knowing seems unknowable. Then how is it possible for humankind to know him? The Kabbalah seems to serve to answer this question in two ways. The first is in the explanation that every idea contains its own contradiction, and God, who is the sum of all ideas, contains all contradictions. Therefore, God is both good and evil, just and unjust, merciful and cruel, limitless and limited, unknowable and knowable, all things which contain their contradictions or opposites, unite to form a greater whole, which is God. From this first answer comes the Kabbalah's second answer, which indirectly relates God to the world. God is seen as a mirror from which shines a brilliant light. This brilliant light is then reflected onto a second mirror, then onto a third then to a fourth, and so on. With each succeeding reflection, the light loses some of its brilliancy until, when it finally reaches the finite world, it shines very dimly. Within this concept of the reflection of light lies the Kabbalist theory for the creation of the world. In the beginning, there was just God, and from himself he sent an emanation often described as light. From this first emanation evolved nine more, ten in all, called the Sephiroth. The ancient Kabbalists taught that the brilliant lights of the Sephiroth uh, constitute the sacred name of God. Their reasoning was that the Sephiroth was the world, 
or universe, and God is the world. What? The reasoning was that the Sephiroth was the world or universe, and God is the world. Okay, therefore the Sephiroth are the facets or parts of God, and they are also are facets of the universe. Okay. The origin of the Kabbalah centers around a short book titled Sefer Yetzirah, Book of Creation. The origin dating of the book is unknown, but it is known to have been used in the 10th century, but may have been composed as early as the 3rd century. The book tells that God created the world by the means of 32 secret paths of knowledge, which are the ten sephiroths and the 22 letters in the hebrew alphabet it is believed that ten sephiroths were originally thought as referring to numbers but later representing emanations from which the cosmos was formed each of the ten emanations within the sephiroth is called a sephirot and together they form what is called the tree of life. This tree is the central image of Kabbalistic meditation. For again, each sephirot describes a certain aspect of God, and taken together as the sephiroth, they form the sacred name of God. The tree also describes the path, a path by which the divine spirit descended into the material world and the path by which humankind must take to ascend to God. Wow, der Text ist echt schwer zu lesen, finde ich. Hm. Another basic teaching shared by Gnosticism and the Kabbalah was that the divine spirit or the soul had descended from God and became trapped in the human body or matter. This was a prevalent theory shortly after time of Christ within the Mediterranean area. This and other religious teachings exemplify how such teachings can reflect the beliefs of the people of the time. The first nine Sephiroths form three triangles with the Sephiroth, with the tenth Sephiroth forming the founda foundation or base. When Meditating upon the Sephiroth, the Kabbalist can concentrate upon any one of the three images which the triangles are said to represent. The images are analogous to God's relationship to humankind and the world. The first triangle represents the impregnation of the female by the male, thus creating the world and child. The second triangle represents the development of the world and child. And the third triangle is the adult person or the finished pr product of the world. The triangles also depict the human body. The first triangle is the head. The second is the trunk and arms. The third being the legs and reproductive organs which is based on the an analogy of the relation between man and God. An illustration of the Sephiroth or Tree of Life is as follows. Kether, the Supreme Crown, God, Chokma, Wisdom, Bina, Understanding, Chizet, Mercy, Greatness, Gebura, Strength, Rigor, Tifareth, Beauty, harmony, Netzach, victory force, Hod, splendor, Yezot, foundation, Malkuth, kingdom, world. With the help of the Sephiroth, humankind ascends to God by gaining the meaning of each Sephiroth, one at a time. The accomplishment of ascending from one Sephiroth to the next is an attainment of knowledge. Making one's way through the Sephiroth is exceedingly difficult, because each Sephiroth is said to be divided into four sections that run the four worlds that compose the cosmos. They are Aziluth, 
the world of archetypes from which come all manifestations of forms, Bria, the world of creation, here the archetypical ideas become patterns, Yetzira, the world of form, here the patterns are expressed, and Asira, the material world. Also within the Sephirot, in the sacred, unknowable and unspeakable name of God, Yahve, or the Tetragrammaron. The Tetragrammaron is so sacred that other names pertaining to God, such as Elohim, Adonai and Yehovah, are substituted in scripture for it. The letters Yahve correspond to the four worlds. The second description of the Sephiroth picture, the world or universe made up of layers or outer skins, such as surrounding an onion. This was generally how the world was viewed from ancient times to the 16th century. God was thought to reside in the outer layer and things closely related to God were within the next outer layer. The most inner layer of this configuration configuration contained the material world. The spiritual soul of humankind descended from the outer layer or God to the inner layer or the material world. This onion skin configuration of the world is definitely shared with Gnosticism, whose chief teaching was that the divine spirit was entrapped in matter, especially the soul in humankind. It is only through the attainment of knowledge that the spirit can escape its material confinement. The Kabbalah, which is based on the theory of the soul's descent from and ascent to God, is made up of ten sephirots instead of nine, which is due to the influence of the Pythagorean theory. Earth has a separate sphere to itself. Above this, the next seven sephirots correspond to the planets, with the top two corresponding to the stars and the prime mover or god. Each sephirot is guarded by angels who determinedly try to turn climbers back on their ascent to god. On the bottom, Sephirots, there are plenty sinister intelligences who can easily trap a soul in ignorance. The Kabbalists hold that some persons can achieve a union with God even before death. There were many modifications and interpretations made of the Kabbalah through the centuries. In the 10th century, the practical Kabbalah was introduced in Italy and then spread to Germany. In it was contained ecstatic practices, magical rituals and mainly techniques of prayer, contemplation and meditation. From it came such techniques as Gematria, Notaricon and Temura. Okay. <laughs> the 13th century saw the birth of the classical Kabbalah in Provence. France. It moved into Spain, where it was developed more extensively by the Spanish Hebrew. The primary work was the Sefer Ba Sohar, Book of Splendor. The development progressed until the Jews seemed to lose their spirituality. Then, after a year it, in a cave meditating upon this situation, a rabbi heard a voice which told him to teach those re ready to learn and let the ordinary people go on their way. From this revelation seem to have developed the Zohar, the teaching recorded by disciples. Chiefly, the Zohar describes God as Em Sof, without end. God is unknowable beyond representation. He created the world out of himself. The chief aim of humankind is to achieve complete union, union with the divine. All things are reflected in a higher world, and nothing is independent of everything else. 
Thus, human beings, by elevating their souls to unite with God, also elevate all other entities in the cosmos. Nine, uh, the nine Sephiroths configured the three triangles in the Sephiroth, with the tenth forming the base. The triangles may be aligned vertically or horizontally, each has the male, a positive, and female, a negative principle with a milder principle between them to create a balance between the two. The male principle is always on the right side or at the top of each triangle, while the female principle is always on the left side or at the bottom of the triangle. Hmm, okay. For instance, the first triangle embodies Kether, Chokma, and Bina. The three principles which each Sephirot are aligned from right to left because Hebrew is written from right to left. Each principle functionally participates according to its characteristics or nature. In general, the male principles, sometimes called forces, are correct uh, characterized as being positive, active, as well as being positive, active, dynamic, or thrusting. The female principles are said to be a combination of good traits which are joined with evil or ominous ones which makes the female principle complex. The feminine principle can be both passive and active at times. It can be both passionate and cold, also tender and cruel. The principle residing between each male and female principle is taught to be a thought to be bisexual, which serves to harmonize the opposites. For example, in the first triangle Chokma, the male principle is opposed by Bina, the female principle. These principles are thought of as the father and mother, respectively, uh, respectively. Chokma, also called the active wisdom of God, acts upon Bina, the passive understanding of God. Kether is the harmon harmoni har 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 harmoni harmonizing principle which keeps a balance between the two. But modern Kabbalists say that it is the thrusting and compliance between these opposing principles which brings about creation. In the second triangle, where the father, mother and child are represented, the Sephiroths are Shezd, Gebura and Tifareth. Shezd, male, is the kind and merciful father who guides and protects the child. Gebura, female, is the strict, authoritarian mother who tears down what Shezd builds up. The balancing principle is the triangle, and this triangle is Tifareth. Tifareth in the sphere of the sun is often compared to the sun. The functions of Tifareth that combines the characteristics of both Shezd and Gebura are frequently compared to those of nature. Tifareth can be both the warming sun that greatly shines on humankind, beasts and crops, and it can also be the fierce heat which suffocates humankind and kills animals and crops. Christian Kabbalists compare Christ to Tifereth, for Tifereth is thought of as the son of Kether, God as being directly descended from it on the tree. Tifereth is the life force which brings forth physical life as Christ is said to give the promise of eternal life. There has been a symbolic association between Christ and the Son since the earliest days of Christianity. The third triangle represents the child's emergence into adulthood. Its sephirots symbolize the struggle between the forces of 
animality and mentality. Netzach, male, is said to represent the endurance and the victory of God. These traits are thought to stand for the all-enduring drives of nature, which allow humankind to act naturally instead of by contri contrivance. The opposing Sephirot is hot, female, which contains the good qualities of imagination, inspiration, insight, and intu intuition, which the Kabbalists admire. But Hot also had the powers of reason and logic, which are distrusted by the Kabbalist. Reasoning is thought to repress humankind's natural abilities. Yezot is the child fully grown, and the harmonizing sephirot between Netzach and Hot. Sexually mature Yezot is able to produce both sexually and mentally. Also it is in the sphere of the moon. So within the struggle between Netzach and Hot, Yezot bring about the best results. The results may not be produced by the best assets within a person, because as, of, as the moon is the ruler of the night and the light of the darkness, Yezot is the dark depth of personality which often lie hidden but suffice. Yezot is the potential magic power within oneself bringing together the magician's highest mental abilities and the animal or sexual drive to succeed at what he wishes to accomplish. Yezot is thought to be the link between Tefereth, uh, Tifereth, the sun or the life force, and Malkuth, the earth or the body. Malkuth, being the base of the Sephiroth, or tree, is the earth. This is appropriate because within earth are found all things of God. It is therefore the kingdom of God, because every principle found with each of the Sephiroths is found within earth. All ideas and their contradictions are found on earth. It might be noted that within the third triangle, and particularly in the struggle between Netzach and Hot, one can see the distinct difference in, uh, of attitude between the Kabbalists and the rest of the world. The same can be said of the Gnostic. Within both of these teachings, the Kabbalah and Gnosticism, reason and logic are distrusted. The reasons given for such distrust is similar that they inhibit the abilities of natural man. Viewing such an attitude from the present-day viewpoint, one might say that their idea of God is even different from that of the average persons. To Kabbalists and Gnostics, God does not restrict man but lets him improve himself through knowledge, whereas to the average person, God does the restricting or is it the person who makes God do the restricting? Hmm. The Kabbalah has been accepted into Western occult ceremonies and practices, and vice versa. In the 16th century, symbols of alchemy were embodied into the Christian Kabbalah. The Christian Kabbalah is said to have been used to prove the divinity of Christ, Alistair Crowley adapted the ranks or grades in his magical organization, the AA, or Astrum Argentium, the Silver Star, to correspond to the Sephiroths of the Sephiroth. The Kabbalah has also been related to numer numerology, the Tarot, and astrology, although some criticize the relationship is not a perfect match. The Kabbalistic idea that God contains all ideas and their contradictions definitely forms the base of the magical laws of polarity and synthesis. Both laws are based on the theoretical assumption that all ideas or conceptions contain their opposites. Examples of these are white and black up 
and down, right and left. The essence of each thing also contains the essence of its op op opposite. A typical clear but not too magical illustration is that a black ink pen does not show up too good on a black or dark colored background. It requires a white or light background to bring out the illustrious nature of the black ink. Here the opposites complement each other to produce the writing or drawing. Law of polarity. The law of polarity says anything can be separated into two opposite parts, with each part having its own essence. This law is, es is essential to many mystical statements and arguments. Also, it is essential in denoting characteristics of objects. Examples of these are white and black, up and down, right and left. See the laws of magic. What? The laws of magic. The saying that magic is not what it seems may be more prevalent today than in the past. Today, when once hear the word magic, one often thinks of the tall, slender, dark-haired gentleman on stage or the television screen in his black tuxedo who pulls the white rabbit out of it, his top hat and juggles balls and glasses or both and saw a, a thinly clad pretty girl in a box in half. Amazingly, he always somehow puts her back together again at best. This could be called theatrical magic, or just theatrics. But it certainly is not serious or real magic. The magic which has been practiced and believed, uh, believed in for thousands of years. Such magic as this is based upon laws, if not fully believed by the practitioners, at least adhered to. These laws have been recognized as the governing, governing structure which makes the magic at least seem to work, gaining for the practitioners the desired results and making people believe in it. Many have, have observed the acts which practitioners attempt and sometimes do perform. From such observations, a classification of the types of laws used was constructed. One of the pioneers to achieve such a classification of laws involved in magic is Sir James George, George Fraser, Fraser, in his The Golden Bow, a study in magic and religion. Many others have discussed such a classification, including Isaac Bonewitz, to whom this writer is indebted for his brief classification of the magical laws, and Richard Cavendish. Briefly, within this article, these laws of magic will be discussed and examples will be given. The reasoning for this is twofold. First, to acquaint the visitor to these laws and to give a reference from which they can be pointed out when appearing in other articles in this encyclopedia. The most basic of all is the law of knowledge, because which, uh, with understanding comes control and power. The more the person or magician knows about a person or phenomena, the more control he has over it. This is an absolute absolute rule which applies to the human organism as well as modern technology. By knowing a person's daily routine, if one desires to alter that person's behavior, all one has to do is change a factor or two and the person's behavior will probably change. A native may walk a certain path daily, once he keeps seeing little mannequins resembling himself, which he believes are signs of danger in the path, he will choose another path. A person, a person with computer knowledge is able to control the computer, whereas a person without such knowledge cannot operate a computer. Within the law of knowledge is a 
specific sub-law of self-knowledge or knowing thyself. The principle which is essential in the law of knowledge is equally applicable what applicable and essential to the law of self knowledge one who does not know himself having never tested himself or his limitations does not know what he can do here is the example of the insecure person but the reverse is also true too. The person who has trained himself and tested his abilities is the secure person. He has by knowledge and training perfected his abilities to the extent that he has control over them and knows what he can make them do. He is the person who controls the computer or any activity which he endeavors to do. This also includes the real magician who has practiced his art until he is proficient at it. Many magicians will say their proficiency lies in their self-knowledge. The law of names is related to both the law of knowledge and the law of association. The law simply states that by knowing the true and complete name of a phenomena or entity, gives you complete control over it. There are two premises upon which this law is based. First, a name is simply a symbol of the definition of a phenomena or an entity. If the phenomena is fire or simply says fire instead of describing the whole phenomena of fire. If the entity is a man or just uh, one just says a man. The names or terms fire and man convey the definitions of fire and man. Names convey definitions to others provided they are spoken in a mutual language spoken by both the speaker and listener. Second, the names of phenomena and entities can expand as one gains more knowledge about the subject matter. This is extremely important because the more one knows about a thing, the more control, control one has over it. In some in, incide, what, incidences, a name of a thing can be traced to its root, even in a foreign language, which will supply one additional information about the thing. This is when the magician combines the law of names with the law of knowledge and when doing so he can select a specific phenomena or entity because he possesses all the knowledge he can about it. For example, the magician does not mention a fire or a man but names a fire in a certain location, a village or town or mentions a man named Thomas. He knows about fire and the location as he would also know about the man called Thomas. This is why magicians have or seem to have a wealth of knowledge. Ancient magicians were called wise men. Some occultists, particularly witches, choose mystical or magical names, which many keep secret because they believe there is power in the names which would be lost if known. Combined with the law of names is the law of words of power. This law is greatly used today. Some think its usage is over exaggerated. Words or terms like teacher, professor, doctor, technician, priest, the pope hold some people in awe. For example, many, especially Catholics, are just as overwhelmed by the pope as ancient people were of the village witch doctor or sorcerer. They believe him to be holy and possess a higher power with, which illustrates the Pope or which witch doctor only possess the power which people give them. If their authority was not recognized by the people, their power would be worthless. In the above example, the Pope, who is wide, widely recognized, is given respect. 
But the reverse can also be true. Strange and mysterious words can affect people differently. The word abracadabra can have a great effect on some people, especially those uneducated or who believe in magic, particularly when it is spoken by someone they respect. The word abracadabra has no meaning by itself. However, its significance comes from its mysteriousness to the listeners and the authority of the one saying it. If the listeners have little or no regard for either the word or the speaker, then abracadabra loses all effect on the audience. The power of the sound of words is demonstrated in chanting, which was used by ancient peoples as it is by neo-pagans. Chanting is the repetition of words and sounds which usually are meaningful to the ones chanting them. It is employed in religious, ceremonial and magical rites. Chanting often combined with dancing, drumming, rattling and hand clapping is generally performed to alter the consciousness and raise power. The next law is the law of association. This law is the most commonly and frequently used of all the laws of magic. This law falls with the principle of sympathetic magic. Simply, this means things react upon each other under certain imposed or imaginary conditions. The law of similarity is the first of two sub-laws contained within the law of association. The second is the law of contact or contagion. The law of similarity states that like things produce what that like things produce like things or that an effect resembles its cause. Okay. Schematically, this may be illustrated as such. Thing A may produce something similar to itself called C. And thing B may produce something similar to itself called C. And this something called C may be shared by both A and B. The law of contact or contagion, the second sub-law uh, of the law of association, follows from the law of similarity. This law states that things which have once been in contact with each other continue to act on each other at a distance, even after physical contact has been severed. This can be shown by the following example. The something or commodity C which is similar to and was shared by thing A and thing B, can, after its detachment from A and B, affect or control either or both. The mutual influencing effect or control these things exert upon each other is depend um, dependent upon the greatness which with which C was shared. From the law of similarity, the magician infers that he can produce any effect just by imitating it. And from the law of contact, the magician infers whatever he does to a material object will equally affect the person or entity the object was once attached to, whether in the form of a body body part or not. Examples of these sub-laws are seen when a hunter eats the liver of a killed lion to gain the strength of the lion and in the people's attraction of blood. They are also illustrated in the Hand of Glory. 
The law of identification or imitation is where one entity assumes the characteristics of another. The more the first entity knows about the second, the better the imitation. If this produces a strong association between both entities, it might almost involve becoming the other entity itself. A temporary identification can be considered a divine or spirit possession. This law is used by witches when invoking the spirit of the mother goddess to enter the high priestess and Ser Nunus what? Ser Nunus to enter the high priest. The law of synthesis or the law of opposites states that, that the synthesis on schwere Wörter ist mir leid. Das sind so schwere Wörter. <laughs> states that the synthesis on two opposing or conflicting ideas or pieces of data will produce a new third idea that will not be a compromise of the original two. This law is used more in mysticism than magic. It allows one to simultaneously hold two opposing ideas without feeling anxiety or cognitive conflict. The law of polarity says anything can be separated into two opposite parts, with each part having its own essence. This law is essential to many mystical statements and arguments. Also, it is essential in denoting characteristics of objects. Examples of these are black and white, up and down, right and left. The law of balance is simply a statement for conserving personal energy and achieving the greatest proficiency. One's energy or power level must be kept on an even keel. Too much or too little will kill oneself. This energy level is best maintained by avoiding extremes in thinking and action. One must be open-minded, able to consider all alternatives, but strong enough to determine one's personal course in life. This requires the right amount of flexibility to be able to examine new ideas or concepts in order to keep the ones which would improve one's life and reject those that would not. In short, one never goes off on deep ends. The law of infinite data states that there always new information for one to learn. The sources of knowledge are limitless if one wishes to tap them. This law can stimulate one to improve his capacities. It can also serve as a warning that one cannot learn or know everything. So it is best to limit one's visions at times and new dangers can always appear. The law of finite senses states that one's senses are finite. They are limited to the amount of information which one can absorb and process at any given time. Simply put, one is pretty sure he does not have all data available on which to base a judgment. The law of indefinite universes states that each person sees his universe or world a different way. Therefore, no two people have identical views of the world. All people do not receive the same information or data. If they do, they view it differently, thus making for indefinite universes. Under this law of in infinite universes are two other laws. The law of pragmatism and the law of true falsehoods. The law of pragmatism simply states, if it works, 
it's true. This is a very useful law because it avoids moral arguments with oneself and others. In this case, therefore, truth has a functional value since it works properly for the person. Such a law allows different responses to the same or similar situations, which is the interplay of the law of synthesis. The law of true falsehoods simply stated, if it's a paradox, the paradox is probably true. This law will hold until a better answer or solution can be found. For many, this article may appear to be a lot of philosophizing, but it does not seem so when the two main laws in magic are stated which are mind over matter and belief. Every good magician knows that it is the mind which controls the body. If it does not, he is in trouble. This is why the magician must know himself and his art. Without such knowledge, he has no art. For, as it has previously been stated, knowledge is control. The second essential law of magic is belief. One must believe in what he does. For without belief, there is doubt. To use magical power, one has to feel it. This applies to everyone, whether one is calling down a deity in a magic circle or praying for a miracle in a church. Doubt leads to failure. Belief leads to success. Perhaps not always physically, but always spiritually. The above laws just place one in a proper attitude to perform magic. Law of Synthesis. The Law of Synthesis or Law of Opposite States that the synthesis on two opposing and conflicting ideas or pieces of data will produce a new third idea that will not be a compromise of the original two. This law is used more in mysticism than magic. It allows one to simultaneously hold two opposite opposing ideas without feeling anxiety or cognitive conflict.